just going to start, I'm, I'm, for me I'm actually quite smartly dressed really, uh, my wife's going to be disgusted because I'm going to put on, just to get more into the, into the spirit of the thing, I'm going to put on this fisherman's smock which I bought I think in 1971, 72, as you can see I don't get rid of clothes very easily. <laughs> Uh, and it's the smock that I used to teach art in many years ago at Kingston High School. And I bought it up from a little shop called, which I believe was called Tip Ladies on, uh, West, I think it was Westock Avenue. And it sold fisherman's smock and they kindly gave me an extra piece of material which I sewed on the front in order to carry the pencils and everything that I needed for teaching kids art because they never brought a pencil so you, you gave them the pencil. Um, that's why it's covered in paint, right? Uh, and it makes me feel a little bit more kind of connected to it. I, I'm very conscious that probably just about everybody in this room knows far more about fishing than I do, really. But anyway, I'm, going to, I'm obviously coming at this whole thing from the kind of artistic side of things. Um, well, I, as well as being an art teacher for most of my life, I actually was an English language teacher. And I would just like to point out the, the title, which I was quite proud of, and the importance of the colon there in just changing this, the whole meaning of that term, gone fishing, into gone fishing, can I say. Uh, right. Um, yes, well, oh, right, you've got me doing the same thing that... I thought you said press that, but you didn't press that one, right? Okay, yeah. All oh, right, yes. Uh, I'm a lover of quotations. This is actually our bathroom wall. And I've got this wall of quotations, so you can sit there in these meditative moments and see these sort of pearls of wisdom. And there's one there that says, great works are performed not by strength, but by perseverance. All right? Now, the memorial that I'm kind of responsible for, I'm not saying it's a great work, but it is to do with perseverance. And in a sense, the, the, one of the messages, I'm, I'm obviously going to tell you about how the memorial is made, but I also in some ways want to inspire you that whatever you're doing in life, you know, keep at it and persevere. Because my story tonight really is one of persistence and perseverance. I think I was rejected a total of three times trying to get this commission and have almost... I'm amazed myself, really, that I ended up getting the job. So, yeah, it's going to be about perseverance. Of another quote that I really like, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Uh, and that is such a lovely marrying of two words that you would never think to put together. I mean, it's the genius of Samuel Beckett. Fail better. Now, my story isn't really about failing, on the contrary, it's about succeeding. But it is about continually facing rejection and managing somehow to keep going. So I want you to... What the heck's going on with this? Right. <laughs> I think it's something to do with uh, my programme to his programme. Never mind, you can see what it is. It's the Guardian. My story begins in March 2013, so four year, over four years ago. This is the first thing, there was a Guardian website alerting me to the fact that Hull was looking for a memorial to the fishing industry. Uh, I immediately went onto the, web, onto the stand website, had a look at what it was all about, went to visit the site, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, and it's a great location, sometimes the commission, the site for various sculpture commissions is rather poor. But really, you could hardly ask for a better site than this, with a humber stretching out behind. It's wonderful. And I read the, obviously, very carefully read the whole design brief. I'll just give you a minute to look at that. And you can see that there's kind of a lot more involved than just doing a sculpture. And in fact, as I maybe kind of slightly show you, is I did also design information boards that were going to have uh, images and old photographs and the text, pretty much similar to things you see around you today, that would be part of leading up to the main sculpture piece. Because there is more to it than just that. 
Now, I'm. By the way, hands up if you were at the unveiling sort of ceremony in the marquee. Uh, not so many, right, okay. Right, that's good because you won't have heard this before then. Uh, but as I said then, I am a whole guy. I, my father started his working life working on the fish dock. Uh, the Second World War came along and then he ended up being a teacher and taught in Hull for the rest of his life. I started as a teacher in Hull at Kingston High School. You know, some of the people, the children I taught were the children of fishermen. So I have got this connection in that sense, not just that I'm wearing the spot, but I have got this connection to the slight connection to the fishing industry. And I think just about everybody in Hull, you only have to kind of go one step sideways and they'll have some link to that fishing industry. And I think that helped me in getting this commission, eventually in getting this commission, because in many ways, I understood it in ways that I think an outsider from Hull didn't understand about it. Hull has always been this very closed, isolated community. Uh, I went to Hull Grammar School, did A-level art, and the art teacher used to let me go out and sketch it. I had art all afternoon, and this is a, a sketch I did when I was 16 at the fish dock. And it was a fantastic place. I mean, it wasn't just visually exciting. There was the sounds and the smells. It was a fantastic place to go. And I went to Bretton Hall College of Education to learn to be a teacher. And this was in 1970, two years after the triple trawler disaster. So still very much a fresh wound. And one of the first projects we had to do in college was we had to do a, a kind of project on our own city, our own town, where we come from. And so I went back to Hull, I interviewed Alan Plater, the Waterstones, various people like that. And this is obviously the, well before the internet. I went to the Hull Daily Mail office and I looked back in their old papers and did sections in my report on the triple trawler disaster. And there's a little bit from, I've still got the, the project, and I find it quite poignant looking at that now. You know, you read that, the owners have said there is no need for anxiety at this stage. I mean, how false those words ended up being. Uh, and obviously, like I would think most of the people in this room, you know, I was, seven, I was 17 when it was a triple trawler disaster, it was this pivotal moment almost in Hull's history, really. It was the first time I ever heard a Hull accent on the television. I thought, blimey, do I sound like that? Yes, I probably <laughs> do. But, but, I mean, it was, tragically, it was this thing that put Hull suddenly on the map. Uh, but despite all that kind of background knowledge on the trawler men, I do believe in doing a lot of research before designing whatever it is we're trying to build here. Otherwise, I think you get a very superficial response. So, you know, I did lots of research. I went to the Maritime Museum, obviously. I went to the Arctic Corsair, had the trip round there. Hands up if you've not done the trip round the Arctic Corsair. Shame on you. Get yourself, get yourself to the Arctic Corsair and go and do the trip. You'll be taken round by an ex trollman It is fantastic. I think it took me, I thought it was going to be kind of 20 minutes. I think I was on for over two hours. It was great. Do go. And I went back to the old St Andrew's Dock. Anybody that remembers it, and again, people in this room, in the 60s, it is a depressing sight now, really. I mean, there is talk of it being renovated one day. I can't see that ever happening, quite frankly. But, yeah, I went back and took various photographs of it. Got the fantastic Lord Line building just slowly going to ruin. I went to the whole new history centre, read loads of books there. Half of them are written, where's he gone? Half of them are written by Alex here. You know, uh, there he is all these books uh, and because of that I actually rang Alex to find out more about it and he was extremely helpful I'm not just saying that because he sat there he was extremely helpful he even sent me an image of an earlier design for the memorial done by a friend of his Arthur Cowan I think it was then in 2007 fortunately Arthur Cowan died in 2012 uh, 
because he was a good friend of Alex, Alex was kind of trying to promote this. Obviously, as an artist, I don't want to pick up on someone else's work. And I then also realised in the brief that I wasn't really supposed to be in contact with members of the standing committee because it would obviously be kind of seen as prejudicial. So I had to very kindly say, thank you, Alex, but I think we need to sort of terminate uh, getting information from you. Um, and the other thing about the memorial, I'm a great believer in figurative work. I like doing things with the human figure. Uh, and I've always felt this Trollmen Memorial needed to be a figurative piece. Uh, as I said at the unveiling, the clue is in the name. It's the lost trawler men of Hull. It, it isn't about fishing. It isn't about ships. You know, we've, we've not made a memorial because we've lost ships. We've made a memorial because we've lost men. And so I felt it was essential that, you know, you'd look at this and you'd kind of immediately know what it was about. Um, that's you on there, Ron, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> and I also, as I say, I don't even think it's about the fishing. Because when they leave Hull, they're not fishing. They've got another week to go before the fishing starts. So I haven't particularly done them in pause. I haven't done them, you know, in that sense, connected to fishing. There are hints of it, the sea boots and the, and the um, kit bags, but it isn't, it isn't that kind of image that I'm trying to project. project. Uh, I have a friend who came from Fraserburgh in Scotland, and she moved to her when she was a teenager. Her father, I think, ran the butchers. I think it was called... Dawson's, is it? Was on Hesel Road, he used to supply the trawlers. And she'd grown up as a young girl in Fraserburgh, which is a Scottish fishing port, and she was used to seeing men in smocks and gansies and you know mending nets and all that kind of thing. And she couldn't believe it when she came to Hull and saw them going off in trawlers, and they're in the suits and ties. And it, it had to be explained to her. Well, that's so that they can be first in the pub when they get, you know, <laughs> off the ship. And it, it, it often takes an outsider for you to realise, yeah, it is a bit strange, actually, that, you know, they're off, he's off to Iceland, for heaven's sake, and he's in his suit and tie. It doesn't make sense. And so, I mean, one of the things you get, you get it at the Lost Trollmen Memorial Service, when that big array of photographs, if you go to the Arctic Corsair and you look in the museum, you just get this huge array of faces of men that are no longer with us. And it's not just the faces, it's the poses as well, the kind of body language. And, and from that, yeah, I felt what we want here is this, and I think again, because of having grown up through the triple trawler disaster, I'm kind of viewing it as a sidewinder trawler, a crew of about 20 men. We're going to put them in this big panorama, partly to try and get across the, the scale of the loss. We're not talking about you know, a few dozen men here. This is 6,000 men we're trying to get across. And so I wanted it big and across the Humber there, fantastic backdrop for it. And that's what I submitted. And I did a kind of plan for the whole garden, and there would be information boards on the paths that led into the sculpture, etc., etc. But sadly, it got rejected. And obviously, I'm disappointed. I, I didn't expect to win. It's a very kind of prestigious uh, commission. I knew there were, there were going to be lots of people trying for this job. I did kind of wonder if I was going to get shortlisted for it. I did feel it was a strong image. Uh, hands up if you know this piece of work. All right, good, good. <laughs> Thank you. Now, this is the first memorial I did. It's the 158 Squadron Memorial at Lisset near Bridlington. And it's to World War II Bomber Command Group. It's been a fantastically successful memorial. I'm, I'm humbled by the success of this. It's the first memorial I ever did, and you can see it's done in the same style as the Lost Trollmen. Uh, it won me what is kind of the Oscar of um, public memorials in Britain. Um, to give you an idea of the kind of prestigious nature of this prize, last year the joint winner of it 
was um, Sir Ant uh, Gormley, Santin Gormley, who did the Angel of the North. He managed to be the joint winner of it. Uh, I, in 2010, was the whole winner of it. So it was a fantastic <laughs> achievement. Yeah, my wife can't believe it. I can't believe it. You know, um, it hasn't, though, in a sense, kind of been a little bit of a double-edged sword in that I become Mr. Silhouette Man and everybody expects me to do another silhouette thing. Now I can do quite a lot more than that. But one of the reasons the initial the design I showed you for the trawler men, or I was told that it was rejected, was because it was a repeat of my uh, Lisset Memorial. Now, I don't want to liken myself <laughs> I don't want to liken myself to the great Michelangelo, but I did feel it, it's a bit like telling Michelangelo after he's done David, you know, oh, we don't want, a, we don't want not another marble figure, you know. So I think the criticism that it was using the same style it is, yeah, doesn't really hold up. Uh, and so quickly, I just want you to, I'll just for a few minutes indulge you. I'll just quickly flip through a few bits of my outlook because I do actually think I'm quite varied. Uh, I lived for years in Saudi Arabia and I used to run my own little Christmas card company and produce Christmas cards based on a kind of Christmas in the desert theme. <laughs> did these for years. I was there in the Gulf War and we all had to carry gas masks around and I did this. I've uh, done uh, stained glass windows. Uh, my wife was a lingerie designer and did um, work for British Homes for BHS and I did storyboards for BHS lingerie. Uh, I've done lots of murals, this is a children's bedroom, more bedroom, children's bedrooms, this is one in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is a Ferrari showroom in Paris, uh, this is a steel pipe factory in Saudi Arabia, it's in the foyer, uh, this is a restaurant in Versailles. And because of my dealing with English language, I've done hundreds of posters and illustrations to do with teaching English language points, various grammar points. This is, if I were you, I would, if I were you, I would. Uh, children's book illustrations, portraits, uh, landscapes. I used to go out sketching in Saudi Arabia. It must be the, one of the worst countries in the world to be a landscape painter. I used to go out painting. And I continue that back here at home. That's in Beverly a few winters ago. And I make little animated toys. That uh, was my first wedding anniversary present to my wife. You can see it's like the pecking chicken thing. It's uh, like the kissing couple. Actually, they don't quite kiss. It's more like the head book, really. But... <laughs> Probably more accurate anyway. Where are you, dear? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to pay for this later on, I can tell you. Uh, and this was uh, our fifth wedding anniversary. Talk. We'd, we'd actually had our first child by then. And you crank the little handle and the cogs go around. And the two figures come up and they twist and meet each other and sort of kiss. And just as they kiss, the little baby <laughs> pops up and then down. That's the danger of kissing, you see. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, I designed a ceremonial archway for the um, Royal Saudi Air Force. Uh, this was a World War II Spitfire sculpture. It never came to fruition, like many things, but it was called the dog fight. And because my wife, I was in Saudi, and my wife was in England, we had a kind of long distance love affair, if you like. And as well as writing love letters, I realised you could do love envelopes. And so in our hall, we have a display of about 20 envelopes. You can see it's got a stamp in the corner. These all went through the post. The, the trick was to try and hide the address in the, you can see it's 25 World Street, Philippa Nail, 25 World Street, Street, Kingston on Holland. They all got through the mail, fantastic Royal Mail service. Sometimes it were based on my wife. Things like that <laughs> get quite exciting. And so I hope you can see, yeah, I'm not just Mr. Silhouette Man, I actually do do other things. Uh, when I got rejected though, I did write to, I've, I've looked back in the kind of emails in the course of doing this talk, and I find it quite interesting to look back on them. So this is, yeah, you know, four years ago. 
And I, I thanked one of the people that I'd used as a referee to send the reference in. And as I put, I think the public would have liked my design. It will be interesting to see what they end up choosing. I hope it isn't some abstract garbage that needs an explanation. As you can see, I'm not a lover of abstract work, really. Uh, this was what got chosen. It was called the teardrop, or the bag of fish, depending on who you were talking to. It was... I don't, I don't want to sound kind of critical of it. I don't like abstract work. I'm sure it would have been a nice piece in that sense if you like abstract work. The, the artist is a, a good art. Gordon Young, he did the fish trail round hole. He's done some other fantastic stuff. So I don't want to sound like I'm mocking it in that sense. I don't think it was appropriate for what we're after. Uh, what was very strange, and oh, this is the Memorial Garden. And that is still going to be the case. So the, the job, in a sense, was given out in two tranches. One for the sculpture and one for the memorial garden, which went to a landscape design company called Colour Urban that are based in London and Newcastle. And as far as I know, the garden is still going ahead. Uh, everybody's waiting for the environmental agency to build a flood defence wall along the front of the Humber. And then that garden will be put in position. And my sculpture, which is sort of pretty much at this end, the bow end if you like, it will be temporarily removed and put back in that position. And I think it will be even better because it will be a, a metre or more higher than it currently is. So it's kind of silhouetting against the Humber will be even better. Uh, so yeah, that's the garden. Uh, but very shortly after Gordon Young was given the commission, this was in the paper, Hold Daily Mail, so this is July 2014, he actually withdraws his sculpture, which seems an amazing thing to do, having gone to all that work to win the commission. He then actually <coughs> refuses to let them use it. Uh, I did actually telephone him. I've rarely spoken to anyone as angry as that guy. Not angry at me, but I was on the phone for an hour to him and goodness me did that man vent his spleen at uh, everything to do with that project. O almost to the point of putting me off trying to deal with it really. Uh, I think, frankly, they were trying to fiddle him out of money really. So, any good news for me though, I try again. Uh, I slightly redesign it. We've got the focus right now. Uh -huh. You look like a yeah, it man? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I slightly redesign it because of seeing the teardrop. I think I wonder if they want a bit more height on this thing and realise that actually adding the gallows would be a good thing because it would get across the trawler idea a bit more. And I get in touch with Colour Urban, the, the garden design company, to say, look, you know, I, I could get you out of this problem. You've lost the sculpture. What about this? Um, they get back to me, they don't want to have anything to do with me, so you've already been rejected once by stand, you know, off you go. I can't get them to meet me or anything, so I'm rejected again, really. Now, the next thing that happens, you probably, some of you will be familiar with this, it's called the bell on the stick. I don't know who designed it, but really I ought to buy this man a drink or woman a drink, because they did me a big favour. This was so pathetic and so disliked by the public that there was a kind of outcry against it. Loads of articles in the paper, this is by uh, ex trollman Keith Ma Ken Madden, uh, you know, we're not having this. And there was article after article in the Daily Mail, and it was on Radio Humberside, this is, uh, this is terrible. And, I mean, forget me whether I want to get the job or not, I as a whole guy felt the same, I was incensed too. We're not having that thing. That's, you know, oh my dead body, that's not going to represent Hull's fishing heritage. And so, what am I talking about here on this one? Uh, I actually build a model now. What you've seen before in my designs, uh, it's not a model, it's all done on Photoshop with sort of superimposing drawing images on top of photographs. I actually build a, a full scale model. And I start taking it round to everybody I can think of, really. Um, Stephen Brady, the head of the council, lots of other councillors, uh, Holy Trinity Church to the um, Falklands Service, uh, Lord Prescott, Alan Johnson, the MP, 
uh, Radio Humberside, Hull Daily Mail. I'm just hawking this. I, I go to anybody that comes in the paper that Ken Madden didn't just saw. I find his telephone number. I take the model round. I see everybody I can with this model saying, look, it could be like this. What do you think to this? Uh, uh, Mr. Fenton, I took it round to him as well. Anybody, really. Uh, this was a bit in the paper, so we're now to March 2015. The, um, the head of standard, the chairman of standard at that time, uh, Charles Pinder, I think, uh, you know, in fairness to him, he liked abstract art. As I say, I don't like abstract art and don't think it's suitable for what we're doing. He, I think, was backing himself into a corner. I have a certain wry smile when I read on the left. It's regrettable Mr. Naylor has taken this somewhat desperate approach to getting his design taken on in place of the Memorial Garden. You bet I was desperate, really. But anyway, <laughs> here's uh, what Wilkins said. I said you'd be on wrong. Uh, this has moved on to May now, 2015. And Ron, who'd been on the committee for years as the treasurer, walks off in disgust, really. I think I'm right in saying that, aren't I? Ron and Anita Waddy, who'd also been on it for years. This whole thing is just going in the wrong direction, and they're sick of it, and they go off. And so I went, I found out where Ron and Anita were, and I took the model round to them, showed them it. They were also, I think, kind of disgusted at how cheaply I could have done it, using a whole company, Campbell's and Son on National Avenue, fantastic whole company. You know, this is all achievable, just give us a job and we'll do it. Uh, there'd already been about 20,000 wasted on the project manager, we've done nothing. Uh, and again, it's the one bit I just want to, uh, if I can find it. We're doing it this way, I can't see my notes, you see. Uh, after I'd seen Anita and Ron, I did get in touch with someone else that I was kind of dealing with. And I, again, this is, this is absolutely correct from my email back to them. I said, both very committed, and I mean Ron and Anita, both very committed to the true ethos of STEM. In both cases, it was all quite upsetting and a sad and too familiar tale of good, genuine people being somehow sidelined by so-called experts. The Emperor's new clothes happens time and again in art. It's such a pretentious subject. It's easy hunting ground for charlatans and egos. And I, I do always feel that that was the case. Um, one of the people I saw was Sean Church, who is now the Mayor of Hull. He was uh, Head of Planning in, in, on the Council, and one of his suggestions was the location was wrong. So I, I did kind of try for other locations. This is dummy up the model uh, on the jetty at the end of the Minerva there, which is a location I always thought would have been quite nice, really. Uh, but finally, Mr Pinder is taken off the committee, and our hero here, Ron, becomes chairman of the committee and everything changes. And they decide there's going to be, I think, five or six submissions again. We're going to, you're going to be able to put your um, display in the Maritime Museum. It's going to be there for six weeks and the public are going to come and vote as to what they want. Now, for me, that's music to my ears because I believe in trying to do something for the public. So I set up my exhibition. Uh, I make another model because Alan Johnson had said look the garden's going ahead you can't have something as big as you're trying to do you need to do a smaller footprint version so I reduce it to a, a kind of more crowded little group and I have big pictures done and a thousand flyers I'm going to really try on this I do think um, I think Ron will back me up compared to what the other artists did I really try because I this is a dream job for me Here's the kind of reduced version, and I reduce it to 13 men, deliberately unlucky. Again, from what Alex had told me, how superstitious the community was. 13 seemed, uh, yeah, it's a good number. You're not immediately obvious that there's 13, but it, it stitches in the fact that they are inherently doomed, really. Uh, 
Alex said they never waved when they left as well, because that was another superstition, that the wave took you down to the waves. But again, because they're, because they're doomed, it seemed okay to have a couple of them waving. It wouldn't really matter. These guys are, are the lost trollermen. And I also decided, kind of almost at the last minute, well, I'll add a little boy to it, just to, just to give it a touch of humour. It's a pretty serious thing. It's just lighten the mood slightly with this little boy figure. You almost become maybe like the kind of little mermaid in Copenhagen, you know, that children will stand next to it and have their photograph taken, which these days with social media, I think is an important aspect of the work. Uh, it's not true at the moment because it's got a gravel surround, but when the memorial garden is finished, there will be kind of sandstone hard footing all around it. And the idea is to embed coins into the, around the little boy, because again, the troll men used to empty their pockets of coins before going on board, another superstition, uh, and the kids were all there to pick them up. So that's the idea on, on that. Seeing as it's whole, I think we're gonna have to embed these coins pretty securely. I haven't really worked out the technical details of that. But yeah, yeah, we're going to have to have some backup supply that we keep changing and something. So here's Ron and me on uh, up north on the 11th of January uh, 2016. The results, it was in there for six weeks, 1,500 people voted, and I'm very pleased to say I was the winner. I got, I think, 61% of the vote, and the person that was second got 19%. So I was a clear winner. It's not, that doesn't matter to me in that sense, you know, whoa, um, haven't I done well? But if you're making a public memorial, it matters to you that you are doing what the public want. You know, I have a responsibility to try and give the customer, if you like, what they want. And so that's very kind of confidence building that most of the people prefer what I've done. Uh, we thought Vic was going to be here tonight, it's not. Um, it was the 11th of January um, for Vic, I'm sure many of you know him, Vic Wielden. It must have been a very um, mixed emotion day because finally we're going to go ahead with this memorial. The 11th of January is the day that the San Romanos goes down. He's looking at the memorial book, there it is, 11th of January, and it's his elder brother that was the skipper of the down there, say, James Wielden, age 26. So I'm sure for the Vic, that was quite a, quite a day, really. Uh, I've been to the memorial service several times because of kind of getting involved in it. So this is in 2016, and I put up a little bit of a display so that people would know what they were gonna get. The uh, standard kindly done um, sort of drop down boards for each of the artists on display. I'm, my full name is Peter Walwork Naylor. Walwork was my mother's maiden name, so I'm Peter Walwork Naylor. On the board, it had me as Peter Walworth Taylor. So I thought, you know, one name out of three correct here. I did, I did actually have to take the brush and change that. Yeah. And again, I think this lady, you're in there, are Yes. As you know, people put flowers as tributes after the memorial service. It's always a very touching thing. It's actually quite difficult to do. It's very difficult to get the flower to actually get to the Humber. So one of the things I'm conscious of, with the, right from the start, this memorial is going to be a headstone. People are gonna put flowers at the memorial. And I've always seen it as that, really. You know, the sea is the grave, but this is the headstone. Uh, one of the things I'm hoping with the landscape design company, but they don't seem keen on the idea, is I think maybe some kind of system of grill in front of the figures so that flowers can be inserted in there and would be in a sort of water trough to kind of keep, preserve them a bit longer. But we'll see whether we can manage that. Right, so in that sense, you could say the real work now starts. I'm given the commission and I now have to get it right. I use myself as a model a lot of the time and I take hundreds of photographs of various poses. And if we just take something like the shoes, I take loads of pictures of old boots and shoes 
Or if we take the little boy, this was one of the first images. I mean, the boy will go through, like all of them, about 50 permutations before I'm happy with it. This was one of the early ones. I realised, talking with the engineer, with Brian Campbell, that if we keep him narrow at the base, when we curve the steel, because we put a slight curve on it, A, it makes it more interesting, but it also makes it much more rigid. If it's a flat piece of steel, you can bend it fairly easily, but put a curve on it and it becomes very robust. Because it's so narrow, trying to put the curve on is very limited. So, you know, we need to widen it. One idea was to add a kit bag to the side of it. I wondered about putting a little dog with it, but it just seemed a little bit too cutesy, really. And then I realised, well, let's just kind of splay his stance. And I think it becomes a more interesting stance and it allows us to get that wider thing. Uh, even then, you can see if you look at his, uh, his left foot, it's a huge club foot on here, I don't know why, so I had to modify that. There's a slight adjustment to the angle of the head, various little adjustments, it goes on and on and on. Just things like waving the hand, there must be 50 photographs of trying to decide how to wave the hand. Um, and, but you know, eventually you have to say enough's enough. That's it. You can go on to fine tuning forever, but at some point you just have to let it go. And uh, you can see what I mean about the sea boat. So try to get the, the trawling image across with just little touches like that. And we end up with our 13, well, 14 figures, including the little boy. Oh, that, can you just go back one? He was nodding off there. Uh, I mean, the other idea in that group as well is to sort of get across the camaraderie aspect. That's why they're in twos and threes. This kind of teamwork effect, this strong Hesel Road community quality about it. I've all, oh, just go back again one, sorry. He's one of my favourites, the guy with the fat. I mean, it's politically incorrect these days, but I just felt I had to put somebody with a, a cigarette, and I like the swept over hair as well. So I always like that guy. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's me. Yeah, it's me. Um, and just an awful lot of time spent looking at the faces and trying to get the faces right. Tr trying to get a whole mix of ages and expressions, some happy, some not so happy. Uh, I said at the unveiling, it's a bit like being Dr. Frankenstein. I'm kind of taking an ear from here and an eye from there and blending them together in the hope that people will put their own interpretation onto the faces. There will be somebody there that they feel that looks a bit like Uncle Bob. And people are very good at doing that. On that 158 memorial that I showed you, the Bomber Command one, I once had somebody come to me and say they'd been to see it and there was an elderly lady looking at it and she explained to him that it was based on her husband's crew. Her husband had been in 158 on a mantelpiece, she had a photograph of his crew and he, she was pointing out and that's the navigator and he's the rear gunner and there's my husband and that and that. Was that correct? I said, no, it, it's not correct at all. Uh, but in a sense, it is correct. I'd be the last person to tell that woman that that's not what it's based on. And the whole point is, in a sense, it is correct. If that's what she sees, then that's what it is. I only do half of it. I just put that thing in front of the viewer, and then the viewer adds their interpretation. So if you can see whatever you want to see in it, then that's what it is. And so, you know, I desperately hope that people will see who they want there. When we were installing it, I talked to the, the crane man who was lifting her into position, and he said, oh, yeah, my dad used to uh, work on, he wasn't a troll man, I think he, he worked on the dock as amazing. Oh, yeah, no, that looks like, oh, it wasn't his dad, it was his uncle. That looks like my uncle. And I thought, great, that's just what I want to hear you say. Uh, Campbell and Son Limited, National Avenue Hull. If you need anything making in metal, go to this lot. They're fantastic. I, I love them. My wife, my wife thinks I spend more time with Brian Campbell than with her. Really. This is Brian Campbell. We kind of take it from my computer, put it into his machine. We have to do some messing about with it. 
Eventually it goes down to the laser machine in their factory floor. They've got several lasers. Some of them are worth half a million pounds. You know, this is serious heavy industry. One of the things I've tried to do throughout the production process was take anybody that wanted to go and see it to go and see it being made. So here's uh, most of the stand committee going to, to look at it. And Campbell's are fantastic at letting visitors go onto the factory floor and see this uh, working. I mean, you can see nobody's got a, a helmet on or a high-vis jacket. This is heavy industry. Touch wood, there's never been an accident, but he's great at letting people go right up to the machines and have a look at them. So here we are, this is a sheet of steel going on, and that's the laser cutting it. It's special steel called Core 10. Um, that's a patented American name. Its generic name is Weathering Steel. Uh, the 158 is made out of it. Angel of the North is made out of it. It just um, it oxidizes very quickly, as you can see there. This steel has been outside, and it's already started to rust fairly quickly. It's partly why the laser is sparking so much, because it doesn't like the dirty steel. Uh, it cuts about one millimetre cut, so it's using a magnet to pull out the bits that cut because they're tightly embedded. Oh, there it has to actually hammer them out. Most of the time, uh, Campbell's are making just kind of industrial fittings. You can see from the blanks down there that they've been cutting circles out. They don't normally do kind of artistic stuff like this. Uh, Brian Campbell, he's very much a hands-on engineer. He likes getting involved in it. So here's our first two figures. Uh, what I also like is the, the unpretentious way in which it's treated. You know, people get awfully precious about art. But here you can see that the workman's boots have been on it, which is great. I mean, that's all it is. It's just a piece of steel. You know, like most art, it's pain. It's, you know, we've done it once, we can do it again. It's not a precious thing. And so here's our first figures off with the, the stand committee there having seen it. Uh, the next stage is going to have to have that bend put on it. This is half an inch thick steel. There's this huge roller machine. It's capable of 140 tonnes of pressure. Gets put in and we just put a slight curve on it. After that, it has to have a base welded to it. So it goes over to the welding section. Gets the base welded on. And then it gets put outside in the yard to continue rusting. It will take uh, upwards of a year to totally oxidise. You know, there it is, first piece, everybody out there with the camera. And already you start to get these kind of accident, not accidental, because I know they're going to happen, but they're not totally within my control. The nice sort of shadow effects you get on it, or the sun coming through them. Oh, I really liked this uh, puddle that was in the yard, it gave it a lovely kind of reflecting pool, which having just been to, as Alex said, to not Holy Trinity anymore, what is it called? Yes. The Minster, Holy Minster, yes. right, okay. Uh, well, you know, they've got those reflecting pools in front of it. It would be fantastic to get that kind of reflecting pool in front of the trollmen, but uh, if you go on a, a rainy day, you're probably going to see that reflection. Uh, the TV came, uh, there's Vic again, with a, he was posing for the television with a photograph of himself, aged 10 I think there. His father takes him on his first trip, stowaway, onto the trawler. He said, I remember Vic said, it was great, he said, you didn't need to wash, <laughs> you, you didn't need to change your clothes, you could sleep in your clothes, it was a boyhood dream. <laughs> I thought if only my wife would let me, you know. Uh, this is the, um, the gallows bit, it's the only bit that we had to make slightly three-dimensional because it's so tall and relatively thin, we just need to beef it up a bit so that it's solid enough. It's got these words on the top for those in peril on the sea. If you're not aware, I think it's an uncanny whole connection that the man that wrote the music for the Eternal Father, Strong to Save, was a whole guy. So I think it's fantastic that that connection is there to John Bacchus Dykes, is the name of the organist and hymnist 
that wrote the music for Eternal Father. Uh, and I, I also wanted those words on because as well as it being a memorial, I do almost want it to be a prayer really. That this isn't just for uh, an industry that is dead, an industry that is no more in hope. It is a kind of prayer to, for all those that are still out there on the sea in terrible conditions. Uh, I get camels to make me miniatures of it, which I then need to kind of move around and try and work out how we're going to arrange all these. Uh, it's quite tricky to do, and I shine a torch on it to try and get some idea of you know where the sun's going to come from, what's the best way, can, if, if that's there, does it block the view of the other one? Uh, so there's a kind of messing around like that. It, it's tricky, that, to be frank. <laughs> Uh, I decide on the arrangement, back to Campbell's, and in their yard we again set them out as we think they're going to go and have another check on it. Go around the edges, make sure there are no sharp edges, anything that somebody can catch the finger on. And this gets cut really fine. I kind of promise Stan and Ron, we're not going to let another memorial service go by without having this sculpture in place. You're not going to get the garden done, but you know, we're going to get that sculpture. Um, one of the, I could have pointed it out on that memorial book, the man that did the illustrations for the memorial book, um, what's he called? Wedge? Wedge? Eric Wedge. Eric Wedge. Right, he died in 2016. Uh, the service was here, wasn't it? Where's Tony? I think the service was here. Anyway, you know, it seems a real shame that someone there so committed to that whole history of the fishing industry dies before seeing this memorial. Uh, and so, you know, time is pressing on this. We can't just keep letting it drag on. So, luckily, we managed to, at the 11th hour, get permission. So, I don't think they'd even properly own the land, but they got permission for the concrete pad to go down to put the figures on. I was saying, you know, worst scenario, we're gonna bring these figures on the back of a lorry, but we've got the concrete down. I think this is 6th of February, 2017, Monday morning, grey Monday morning, we bring the figures. All the TV, BBC, Look North, ITV, S3, everybody's there. They get bolted, uh, drilled down into the concrete, and then they get bolted down, because we are going to move these when we get the garden done, lift them, then put them back again, <coughs> slightly higher up. This is Monday, the memorial service is Sunday. We don't want people to see it in those six days, so MKM in Beverly very kindly donated sheets of plywood to me to kind of cover them up. We still leave the hands as a kind of little teaser view, really, of it. Uh, yeah, I wasn't quite sure about where I was fastening that block of wood on that. <laughs> and we use it as a quick bit of advertising for the memorial service. And then six days on, it's the Sunday, and we have the memorial service. This is, this is early on. The tent by the finish, the marquee was absolutely packed. And I had friends who went, when, and they left it too late, it was 10 minutes before the service and they couldn't get in. So I think we had about 800 people in there. It was absolutely packed, standing room only. I get to talk, uh, Sentinel comes, does a fantastic job. He was on great form. Uh, you can see Tony here and the Bishop of Hull, Alison, uh, and it gets blessed by the Archbishop. So it was a really kind of prestigious moment. The weather was appalling, rainy, cold, windy, but as everybody kept saying, it was appropriate for what it was. I mean, that's why the service is always in January and February. This is when the ships go down, when the men are lost. And it's a, an emotional day. How could it be otherwise? Uh, then back to the Alexandra pub, for uh, they always put on a buffet after the service and we go back there. If you've never been to the Alexandra pub on Hazel Road, go, it's a fantastic little place. And that's it really, there's the memorial sort of in completion on its site. As I said, when we get it even higher, it's going to be silhouetted even better. And 
This, I think I said at the um, memorial service, you know, you need to see it at all times of the year. This is actually from my uh, 158 Squadron Memorial. This was obviously taken in winter with hoar frost on it. Imagine if we get hoar frost on the trawlermen, given the images that uh, Alex was showing of the ice on the trawlers. That would just be so fitting. It would be chilling in every sense of the word, really. So I am hoping for that effect on it. And you get these lovely shadows. I took that just a few days ago. And it, there's the shadow of me taking the photographs. It's one of the few things where it's all right to get your own shadow in the photograph. This was it, kind of wet with condensation. Uh, one of the MKM guys put that on the internet. So already, you know, it belongs to everyone. It's out there for everyone. There's the little boy that talked about, just finish with this. He's smiling, but if you look very carefully, because there was condensation running down it, if you look at his eye, it's just a teardrop forming in his left eye. And by the way, on a lot of the men, their noses were also starting to drip. But you know, that's an effect I never realised was going to happen. Never realised a teardrop would come in this little boy's face. I, I think it's wonderful that, you know, there's a happy face, but there's this little bit of sadness in it. And I think in some ways, that's a, a reasonable summary for a memorial, uh, if not for life, really. Uh, and on that note, I think we're going to finish it. Thank you very much.